I wanted to, to read a little bit from the, from the introduction of my new book and then talk, which was published in June of all times, uh, right in the middle of a pandemic, and talk a little bit about, um, you know, creativity in, in the time of COVID and, and um, you know, how, uh, you know, we've all, you know, all us creatives have sort of undergone a makeover of sorts in the last six months and um, how that's affected us and um, you know, how we can sort of, as a community, get through it all. It looks like you're doing pretty well. Um, but let me actually, um, <clears throat> before, but let me, let me turn to, uh, let's go to the share screen, and you can all tell me if you see what I'm saying. That's, <clears throat> all right. <laughs> yeah, oh I, I always like starting with this one, because it takes everybody's breath away. She was, this is my daughter. She's five days old in this picture or four days old, something like that. And uh, the book that uh, came out in June is called You and Me, uh, Reflections on Becoming Your Dad. And it's a collection of essays um, uh, over the course of my daughter's, the first five years of my daughter's life on fatherhood and parenting. And, and of course, um, all of that has taken um, a, a, a much deeper meaning now in this time of COVID, uh, because as I was mentioning to Gail, um, uh, because of the pandemic, I, I went from being a full-time writer to a full-time stay-at-home dad. And uh, that, of course, changes everything. So what I want to do is um, I'm going to read from the introduction while I show you a few slides. And then we'll catch up on, on how the book came out in the middle of a pandemic and what happened there. So let's just begin with that. So this is, like I said, this is her uh, five days old. She was always sort of a ham in front of the camera. Uh, she's always quite photogenic. <clears throat> and let me uh, see how I can go forward here. There we go. So <clears throat> here we go. Writing about the wonders and agony, agony of parenting became a way for me to channel my own creativity toward questions I've long held about philosophy and spirituality and indeed our role in our own lives and in the lives of others. Parenting became a sort of religion, and I became an eager student. Um, this picture, when she, when she was six, this is her first like photo shoot. You know, we went to the mall, and it was one of those uh, cheapo mall photo shoots, and we dressed her up, and um, and she she pretty much killed it. She's six months old here. So I wrote directly to my daughter, like an epistolary novel to her about her life. We became parents at an older age, and someday. Maybe she'll be able to hear my voice through these letters. When she was uh, 10 months old, um, we got in a plane with her um, grandma and grandpa, and we spent a month and a half overseas uh, in India, Turkey, and Nepal. This is uh, Istanbul. This is, that's the, um, the, blue, the blue mosque in Istanbul. Her great-grandmother lives in northern India, so uh, she was, you know, older at the time, and she couldn't come here. And we wanted the only way that we could, um, we wanted Uma to meet her great grandmother. So uh, before she started walking, we decided to to take her take her with us um, and uh, go overseas. So as time went on, the passages became longer and more complex. As she grew and changed and learned, so did I. The questions became deeper the answer is less certain, and a critical understanding of my role in her life, and by association, my life, began to emerge. There she is with her great-grandmother. This is in northern India. Uh, you can see where she gets her those eyes from. Um, and this particular trip ended up uh, becoming a, a, my, my first book collection of poetry called Invincible One uh, of this particular trip. And she surprised us. Uh, we took her when we did because we thought that uh, having her on the road uh, like this uh, at only 10 months old, 10, it was about 10 and a half months old, uh, before she was able to walk would be a lot easier to travel with her when she wasn't walking. Um, but she had other ideas. She actually uh, uh, took her first steps um, in uh, uh, Hagia Sophia, uh, the great cathedral in Istanbul. Um, in what was what's called the throne room, the area of, of this 2000 year old building where the cardinals and the sultans over the years would uh, would sit. So uh, her first whenever anyone asks me, 
you know, did I see her take her first steps? I did in Istanbul and Hagia Sophia. So it was quite a, quite a moment for us. That I had become, that I had to become content with not knowing things and with finding joy and awe in the glorious mess of parenting where the next day, sometimes the next minute offers yet another unknown <clears throat> where there is rarely a roadmap. It's one of my favorite pictures of her. I think she's about three, maybe two and a half here. I came to look forward to these bouts of not knowing, excited, in fact, about the next thing to learn, the next tidal wave of organic information, accepting what the next day will bring, the, uh, whoops, accepting that the next day will bring yet another challenge and that I couldn't possibly predict what that would be became calming, in fact, like the purest form of living mindfully. This was the ultimate way of living life in the moment. So when she was, uh, this is, she's three and a half here, and this is the summit of Mount Washington. Um, as uh, Edith will, will, will let you know, my daughter plays a, a role in my book about the history and culture of Mount Washington. And um, she's been uh, up there several times over the years. And uh, in fact, it was funny, it, while I was doing the research for the book, I spent so much time at the summit of the mountain that um, she actually thought at one point that I actually worked up there. Um, and she heard, uh, she heard um, uh, there's a, uh, what is it called? The, um, oh my gosh, who's, Gail, what is, what is uh, uh, Miss Frizzle? She's, um, what's that series with the, the, the mag magic, magic, the magic bus, the magic. School, school house. No, it's the school house. The magic school bus, the magic school house yeah, bus. But, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm blanking on it. She saw, she saw a little episode, one of the cartoon episodes where they, they, they actually mentioned Mount Washington. They did. Episode, and she came running into the room and she said, Miss Frizzle, daddy is going to be at your work. <laughs> so, <laughs> How funny. Um, so I'm going to stop share for a second. So, yeah, so I had this book, right? And um, in, uh, I had no... I had no intention of writing a book, a, a collection of essays about my daughter. This wasn't part of the plan. <clears throat> but um, over the my, when when she was born, when my daughter was born in December of 2014, in fact, her birthday is coming up in a month. She'll be six. Uh, when she was born in 2014, it was a difficult delivery, and we had some uh, health scares. And we ended up uh, having to stay in the hospital, um, in the maternity ward of the hospital for nearly two weeks, which I think is probably a record for the maternity ward. And we stayed there so long, in fact, that um, I mean, as my wife's parents had to come and stay at the house. And um, I basically lived on, on the couch in the maternity ward. We got to know all the nurses there. And there's a lot of time, you know, you have a lot of time to process what's happening. And I had a, a couple of notebooks with me. So during my off hours, I didn't get a lot of sleep. Um, so during you know the times when they were asleep and when I felt they were safe, I would just write. And I began to write, keep a journal um, of her and of what was happening to us. And you know, my wife was on a lot of painkillers and so forth, so she wasn't remembering. So I wanted there to be a record of what was happening to us. And I started reaching and I didn't, I didn't have the strength to be on the phone all the time with relatives and with friends telling them what was going on. So I used social media as a way to connect with all of our friends and our family to keep them up to date on what was happening with Uma and what was happening with, with Mina. And um, it, as it turns out, the more I did this, um, the more I discovered that, that we weren't alone, right? That there was this community of parents um, that, that were going through a lot of the same issues and, um, that I, you know, that sort of the the mythology, the romantic mythology of childbirth was just that was just the mythology, um, and it wasn't as easy as people as the Hallmark movies make it seem. Um, so we really developed a community, and I kept writing. Right, even after we got home, um, I would just write. I would just fill these notebooks with these sort of philosophical thoughts, and I would be posting things on Facebook. So I had all this, I had all this writing down pat already. And then in, uh, in uh, the fall of 2019, my publisher um, came to me and she said, well, we're starting this new series called the Reflection Series, and it's going to be one author per book um, writing a 
collection of essays um, on one theme or one subject. And she stalks me on Facebook. So she knows that I write a lot about, about Uma. Um, so she, she said, why don't you be my leadoff author? You've already written all this stuff. It should be pretty easy for you to put this book together. And I said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So I went back. Um, I went back to all the notebooks. There's six notebooks, and there's all the postings that I did on social media. And I collected um, all of the writings that I did since day one of, of Uma's birth, and it came out to about 350,000 words that I had written about her in five years. 350,000 words, and uh, my publisher wanted about 40,000 words. <laughs> so, so the book, needless to say, there was a whole encyclopedic set that was already written. All I had to do was just edit it and edit it and edit it and narrow it down um, to fit for this book. So um, all the editing happened over Christmas uh, of, of 2019 and in January or so of 2019, of 2020, um, we had set a release date for June. Um, as we always do, we had all the marketing material had been Put together, um, it went through all the editing, it went through all the covers. Uh, everything was all all set to go. Here's a here's the cover of the book. You can see that. And um, so I sent the the final manuscript went to the uh, printer at the end of February, and about three days later, um, the entire world went into lockdown. <laughs> so, so, what do we do? <laughs> you know, um, I had uh, between. Uh, it was going to come out as a Father's Day book as for the holidays. And between January 2nd and Father's Day of this year, I had about uh, 20 events set up. I had 20 events in 22 days um, that were set up, and every single one of them was canceled uh, because of the pandemic. So uh, we moved a lot of things online, of course, like we're doing here. And uh, we sat down. I sat down with my wife, and I sat down with my publisher, and I said, well, you know, do we move this back to fall? Do we, do we cancel it for a year? What do we do? And we all decided the gears were, the machine was rolling. Uh, let's release the book and see what happens. Um, so we did. And uh, it, it did um, not as well as it would have if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, but it did better than we had thought it would do. So there's, there's that anyway. So we released it. I've been doing all of these sort of um, um, Zoom events and uh, virtual events and, and selling it online. It's a whole, I literally changed my office. I, I created a studio in my office um, with light sticks and with better production values and so forth, knowing that this was going to be my future for the next year at least. And I'm betting, I mean, I guess Gail could probably tell you this better, but, um, you know, we have now gone six or seven months of this and there is this this new infrastructure, right? That is this new virtual infrastructure that didn't exist six months ago. And my bet is, is that even when we go back to normal, whatever normal is gonna be, this infrastructure is still going to exist. And like Gail was saying, there's still people, you know, there's patrons now who prefer curbside pickup to, you know, walking into the library, things like that. So we're creating a, a whole new way of, of um, of being an artist, you, you know, and, and that's, and some of that is not going to go away. I'm sure as Pearlie will tell you too, some of that is not going to go away. So we have to deal, we have to sort of live and create inside the confines of this new world, um, uh, whatever, uh, this new world that seems to change every single day on us. So going forward, I was trying to figure out, well, what do I do now? Um, my daughter, uh, we pulled her out of preschool. She was, she was going to pre-K um, in March. We pulled her out of there when everything closed. Um, so I immediately, my wife was working full-time. She was working from home, but she was working full-time. So um, I, that meant I became a stay-at-home dad. Um, that was just how it was. There was no other options. You know, we weren't, there was no, there's no such thing as babysitters, <laughs> you know, um, well, we were fortunate that her grandparents live up the street for us, so they became part of our pod, which is nice. Uh, so there was some babysitting and things that we could depend on them for. But we have to figure out what to do um, and how to, how to, um, you know, this was, I'm sure to some of you, this is not a, not a new thing, but it was very new to me. Um, I had to, I had to be, become a teacher 
to a preschooler and to a kindergartner, which is fine because I love being with my daughter. Um, but you know, you also have to find you have to find ways to educate, but you also have to find ways to entertain, and you also have to find ways to to not drive yourself crazy too. So we have to, you know, you have to walk this fine line. And and in March and April, we thought, well, you know, this will all be beyond us, past us by the fall, and she'll be able to put her into kindergarten, and that did not happen. So now I'm a kindergarten teacher as, as on top of being a writer, you know? So welcome to my new life, you know? Uh, so I had to figure out how to meld, meld the two things, you know, how to, how to be her dad and her teacher and a writer with a career at the same time. So one of the things that we did uh, was a new project that I started. I mentioned this to Edith a little bit. In the, the uh, spring of next year, I have a new book coming out on the history, a trail guide and the history of the New Hampshire fire tower system, which is a, a pretty important um, and, and not very much written about um, aspect of New Hampshire's um, sort of forestry history. So that's coming out. So in order to, uh, so part of that book, is that in uh, the spring of this year, my daughter and I set out to hike um, to the 15, there's 15 active fire towers in New Hampshire across the state. And her and I hiked to all of them and she earned a little patch for her efforts. And it got us outside, being outside and being out in nature, especially on a weekday is a lot, was, a lot, was safe, uh, relatively speaking. Um, so, and it was a learning experience, you know, it was, we were able to actually get into earth science and, um, and, and the sciences and, and that type of thing. So that's one thing we did. So I'll show you a couple of pictures for that, from that. Um, here we are, this is Mount Kearsarge. Uh, this is in the early, early fall, early summer. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is on, in the state park in Pawtuckaway. You can actually see the grasshopper leaping off of her hand there. Um, she became quite a, uh, a, um, a uh, how, how do I put it kind of politely? She, she, she loves bugs, let's just, let's just say. And she became quite the grasshopper whisperer. Um, and uh, there she was talking to one of her friends as he leapt off her hand. Uh, so when you climb all of the, all 15, now uh, you can earn a patch. The state has what's called the Fire Tower Quest. And uh, this is her displaying her patch. And, that patch is going to go on her backpack uh, as her first earned uh, as her first earned hiking patch. And here we are up in Loudon at uh, at Oak Park, the fire tower at uh, at on, on Oak Hill uh, in Loudon, just outside of Concord. So that was one thing that we did. And um, so that was one way that I was able to blend my career with with her. The other thing that we started doing which came about um, quite by accident was, uh, you know, you, as you, we would have all, would have these whole days together, her and I, and um, she's a, a very, um, she's a very active kid. You know, she's, she, she keeps me on my toes. So I'm constantly looking for ways for, for the two of us to be involved in things that the two of us like to do. And uh, I remember, um, we were in the middle of cleaning her bedroom or cleaning the house or doing some sort of cleaning thing. And I picked up one of those um, exercise, one of my wife's exercise, little stretchy rubbery things, you know, you put under your feet and you stretch it up and you exercise with it. And it was this beautiful sort of dark blue, shade of dark blue. And I'm, a, I'm an art history ma a minor. I minored in art history in college. And it looked to me like that the 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 the, um, the 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 kerchief the from Vermeer's girl with the pearl earring you, you everybody know that painting with the the very famous painting <clears throat> and I think I must have said it out loud I said you know oh this looks like you know the girl with the pearl earrings stocking and my daughter overheard me Uma overheard me and she said well who's the girl with the pearl earring and I'm always looking for something that's interesting to teach her so. We went, we Googled it and we learned a little bit about Vermeer and I brought up that painting, the girl with the, the pearl earring. And I sort of jokingly put it on her head, you know? And I, I was like, oh, see, you could be the girl with the pearl earring. And she said, yeah, I wanna, I wanna be that, let's do that. 
So we spent the rest of the afternoon um, trying, trying on different sets of clothes. Um, and we began a new project, uh, an art re recreatment, pro re reenactment project, starting with uh, Vermeer's painting. And uh, there's the first one that we did. Um, and this was a whole afternoon, of course, uh, of work. And it was a whole lesson plan. It wasn't just dress up. You know, we learned about art of the time and the different methods and the techniques that he used. She actually found that earring. It was around Easter time. And uh, that's an egg, little, like, like a little egg decoration for a tree. Um, that's my shirt that she's wearing. That was the closest color that we could, that we could find. Um, none of this is Photoshopped, by the way, because I don't know how to do that. So this is all just um, apps on my phone um, that I've used to, that I used to do the different colorizing and so forth. So this is something that we've been doing weekly now. And uh, it's something that she's really loved and really gotten into. And um, I can show you a couple of these. I think you probably recognize that one. Um, <laughs> That's great. That's so sweet. Yeah, and you know, what's interesting is I learned a lot too. I learned a lot about technology, of course. That background, um, if you Google Mona Lisa background, you can actually get plain backgrounds uh, of the background that we used. So all I did was download a high resolution image. I hooked my laptop up to our flat screen TV, um, uh, put the image up against the flat screen TV and that became our photography studio. So I put her up against the flat screen TV and that's where we took these pictures. Um, and she helps with all of it. You know, she helps me do the hair. Um, we help pick out all the different clothes. And um, there's a ton of stuff about, you know, Leonardo da Vinci um, in kids videos and ways to learn about him. And, um, and, you know, she did a lot of drawings herself. So this has really become um, sort of these art lessons that we've been doing. <clears throat> <laughs> also one of our favorites um, this was actually a family history lesson it turns out my aunt um, so it would be her great aunt I guess my aunt was worked at Westinghouse as a riveter uh, in Buffalo New York during um, World War II so her name was Vi and she actually was a Rosie the Riveter so we talked a little bit about that and I showed her this image and she immediately wanted to do this one. She really liked this image. And it was the same thing. I, I simply downloaded that back. I uploaded that background into our, into our flat screen, posed her in front of it, uh, played with some filters to, uh, to cut down on, on some of the glare. And you have a you know, Rosie the Riveter um, poster. She really liked doing this one. So the next one, um, uh, it, was, it was my favorite. She, uh, we were doing a science class, and we made we made a telescope out of a paper towel roll, and she decorated it. And we put a little magnifying glass at the end so we could learn about um, the stars and things like that. And she was running around with this paper towel roll, and she she ran into the uh, a door. She didn't see like the. A, a door jam at the end of a door and she ran into it while it was on her eye and she gave herself a black eye and it was quite a shiner that she had and it reminded me i said you know i uh this reminds me of a uh, norman rockwell painting uh called the girl with the black eye and uh so we since she had the scars already we decided to do that one and there she is um the, um, this was her favorite too. She, you can, she really got into this one. I think that this painting probably exemplifies uh, her personality the, the most. Um, and this was easy to, for me to do because when she wakes up, she looks like this, that the, 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 the bruises on her knees, that was real. I, that's not a fake bandage. She, and then the black eye that she has on her left eye, that was a real black eye. Uh, so this actually one was was one of our favorites to do. And then um, she's also doing some of them on her own. I wanted her to do a Mary Surratt painting. It's one of my favorite female artists uh, from the turn of the century. And I show and, and because Mary Surratt does a lot of kids. She does a lot of children's pictures, pictures of kids, especially pictures of kids like with cats and so forth. And she has a cat. So I thought she'd really get into that. So I showed her about a half a dozen. 
and she didn't like any of them. She thought they were all boring and, and the kids were all wearing, wearing boring clothes and she didn't like it. So I said, okay, let's, you pick it out then. So I, I just Googled Mary Surratt paintings and she just went through, went through, went through until she found one that she liked. And it was a very obscure painting, one that I had never seen before. Mary Surratt in the 1890s went and she spent a couple of years in Spain. And she did these really detailed, magnificent paintings of Spanish dancers, these flamenco dancers. And Uma picked one out. And it was very, very difficult for us to do. It required a lot of shading and um, uh, the costuming was really tough. And it took us about three days to put it together. Uh, but there it is. <clears throat> and it's a, it was a stunning one. She cut out her own hair, the little, her little loop-de-loop, -loop, that's construction paper. She cut that out. Um, the, um, uh, the cloak that she's wearing are curtains, which we tore down from the window and we, and we put on her. Uh, the fan was a black <laughs> fan, so I had to hand colorize the fan. Um, but it really, it's one of my favorites. And, uh, and it was her selection. So she has pretty good taste. So this is what we've been doing. And I'll uh, stop the share there. Um, so we're learning to be uh, creative, um, you know, inside of our own selves. Um, and maybe, maybe Pearlie knows this. I, uh, I teach a, a, a memoir class as well. And one of the things that um, I always talk about is something called the Tanpura Principle. Have you ever heard of the Tanpura Principle, Pearlie? No. Um, the tanpur is a is an Indian instrument. It's like a lute like instrument that it's like a drone, right? And it's and all the classical Indian musicians, if you're playing a, a sitar or a tabla, um, you have a tanpur in the background. And what it does is it sets the measure for the instruments that are up front. So it's the foundation, right? But you're not supposed to hear it. That's the whole point of the tanpur is that you're not supposed to hear it. And the tanpur principle, as it applies to artists is that you have, you, you have your whole life going on around you and in front of you, um, but you can't hear it, right? It's like your, the everyday things that you do is your, is your drone, is your tempura, uh, taking care of your kids, going out to eat, cleaning your apartment, washing your dishes. That's, all the, that's the real meat of life, right? But we, we push it away. So in this time of isolation, What's been important for me is to recognize that drone, right? And, and to build on it instead of pushing it away and looking because I can't travel anymore. I've done, you know, I'm a travel writer. I can't travel. Um, interviewing people face to face is almost impossible now. It's difficult to go on tours. So I have to find an inspiration and I have to find a way uh, to write meaningfully um, about the everyday that's happening. And the everyday for me that's happening is my daughter. So that's what I focused on. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So Dan, while you're doing all that, do you still find time to do like, to do writing? Like maybe after Uma goes to bed or what, how does that yeah. fit in? Yeah, um, I, yeah, I have to. I, um, so mostly, so like I said, we have her grandparents here. Mm -hmm. So we're, for, we're really fortunate in, in that way. They live about a mile away from us. Um, they're part of our inner circle. So they're part of our, our, of our ring. Um, uh, so, you know, they go back and forth. Um, and her grandmother w was, uh, is a retired elementary school teacher. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, for maybe three hours a day, two or, two or three times a week, um, I, I'm able during, during regular working hours, uh, you know, to pack her a lunch and to send her over to her grandparents' house. And that gives me some time to work and to keep up with things. And also, um, I have evenings. Um, you know, the, the ladies will go to sleep uh, around, you know, eight or nine o'clock or so. And uh, I'll use, I'll work until maybe 1 a.m. Um, and that's my, and I have a couple hours in the evenings. And my wife has, she has a weird schedule. So she has Wednesdays off. So she has Uma every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So Wednesdays are my full day, like one day a week, I get a full day of work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, so I really bear down on those Wednesdays, you know? Um, so yeah, so it's, it's become, 
you know, I, I, you know, you fit, you fit it in when you can fit it in. Um, I, you know, if I have 20 minutes, I'll maybe answer some emails or, um, you know, sketch out, do some outlining or something like that. And, you know, it, it's not ideal, but, um, you know, what, what, what options do we have? We don't have any, you got to make the best that you can with it. So I'm doing quite a bit of freelancing as well, as opposed to the, the long, the long-term projects, which require a lot of interviewing and a lot of, and a lot of more in-depth research at, at like libraries and archives, places where I can't go anymore. Um, so I'm doing a, a lot of freelancing now for um, parenting NH or the Appalachia Journal or um, AMC Outdoors, things like that. A lot of newspapers and magazines, um, which are like short-term projects that I can crank out in a day or two and then get a little, you know, get a little bit of money for those and then move on to the next thing. So, you know, I had to redevelop, redesign the entire way that I, that I work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't work at all. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, she's, we have other things happening or the, the parents have a, you know, the grandparents have a doctor's appointment or, you know, you just roll with whatever you can, whatever time you can find. We're, we're very, we are fortunate. You know, we're very, we're privileged in that we can redesign our life so that we don't have to send her to school, you know, you know that we can do it from home. Not, not all parents are able to do that. So. Mm -hmm. so Pearly, how, what do you think from, um, keeping you so creative these days? You said you were. Well, you, you, you have to write about what you, you know, your art is with, about what you know, what you're doing. And uh, I was, I've been fighting this pipeline mm. in central Texas and uh, yeah. So uh, it was December of 2018 when I first heard about it and I was, uh, me and a few friends were pre presenting um, a documentary every month uh, to a group uh, at the public library in the nearby and uh, we heard about it and first we, we have to we have to find a film that we can show immediately you know next month january um pipelines to educate people about it so we did find this documentary about the atlantic coast pipeline and, uh, and mountain valley pipeline in the virginias and i ended up showing it about four times in my community or maybe five so i had to so I watched it six times, got a lot of information, and the first creative thing that I did from all, with all that information was to write a poem. Mm. Um, so and you know so and then songs also came and a rap came out, uh -huh. um, and uh, so um, in the process of. And I've, I, I was, I've been recording them at home, and which I always have done anyway, but uh, recording on my laptop. And um, but when COVID hit, uh, it was you know changed the way. Um, as Dan found, you know, changed the way he ran his life, and every you know everything got topsy turvy, and and um, so I was spending more time at home, and I had no gigs. Nobody, you know, I was working with Sears playing music for them. I was working at a restaurant one day a week. The restaurant closed in March. So um, a lot of musicians have turned to live streaming, mm -hmm. like doing concerts online. But with, I don't have very good off for uh, internet connections. I have to pay a huge amount of money every month. I mean, hundreds of dollars mm -hmm. every month to get. Um, the technology, the speed, bandwidth that I would need to do live streaming. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, it sounds like you're, uh, uh, well, both of you, it sounds like you're Dan's inspiration, both of you, it's, a, it's come from something that you're really passionate and driven about, you know. Well, I think you just, you have to just keep going. <laughs> Yeah, but so like, you know, like not so lucky, creative people that are in that place when this happened, that they weren't in the middle of 
something that was driving them forward, those people might be having a harder time, you know, to be look outside and find that thing. Yeah. Well, I think, Gail, what, what you're talking about, uh, I've had this conversation with a, a lot of other creatives too. And, you know, there's, you, the, it's one thing to, um, to sort of actively seek sort of the inner life, right? So you, to go inside, to think about the, the big questions, to sort of be comfortable with, oh, oh look, what, you, what is that? There's a piece of jewelry that oh, I wow. made with a friend of mine, hmm. and I have so much fun being creative. Interesting to, um, you know, I've always tried to, you know, you try to appreciate sort of the domestic life and being a dad and and the simple things in life, you know, like I was talking about with the with the tempura principle. But it's um, you know, what you were saying, Gail, it's it's hard, it's harder because this isolation isn't um our choice. <laughs> you know, like forced mindfulness is hard. <laughs> you know, it's it's not like you're you're trying to to find peace with your life. It's like you have no choice. <laughs> you know, you are you are stuck at home now and you need to go inside and you don't have any other options. And that's a lot harder than sort of volunteering. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to, to find the time and to work on meditation. It's another thing to, for, to, for someone to say, you have to sit right down there and meditate right now for the next six months, <laughs> you know, and yeah. that's all you have. So it's true. No. You know, we, I had, um, I, as I'm sure you probably know this, Gail, I had a little practice. I, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, we, we fostered a couple of kids years ago. My, my other daughter, my older daughter, Janelle, um, you know, when, when they came into, and her brother Aaron, they came into our lives when they were eight and, and they stayed with us until they were 13. So five years. And then they moved down to their aunt and their, and I mean, my Janelle is in college now. She's starting her first year in college. So I had a little practice and, you know, Janelle and I, um, you know, wrote the adventures of Buffalo and tough cookie together. And, you know, we, we started doing hiking. So um, I had a little sense going into, you know, outdoor activities and things like that, how to involve the, the kids so that they wouldn't drive you crazy or that you wouldn't drive them crazy. So we, we started that way. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to have the wife that I have too. I mean, Mina is, she's smart and she's funny and she gives a hundred percent and she's an outdoor, you know, woman. And, you know, we very, very early on, um, we made, we made a, a conscious decision that, that the outdoors and that nature was going to be an everyday part of her life. It wasn't going to be something that we did on vacation. Mm -hmm. it was, you know, it wasn't going to be something that was special. It was going to be something that was, that was there every day and she's and she's taken to it you know i mean we we were on the road with her for a 40 hour plane ride when she was 10 months old and she just took right to it um you know the result of course there's upsides and downsides the result is that she's she'll eat anything um she's not afraid of people uh you know she's she'll try anything she she has no she has no walls as far as culture or ritual goes. She, she'll do anything. She'll try anything. The downside is she'll try anything. <laughs> you know, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm, I'm constantly, I find myself as she gets older, um, pulling her back more, more often. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you cannot just pet any dog on the trail. No, you, you, you should, you can't just walk up to any adult and start talking to them, you know? Like, no, you can't go to the edge of that rock. No, you can't put that in your mouth, you know? Um, so my wife and I are always joking about, well, this is, we asked for it. <laughs> you know, this is, yeah. Um, you know, I just wanted to say, Dan, what you wish for. Uh, I just wanted to say that I really love that project that you did with your daughter uh, oh, based you. on on the pictures. Mm. I've never seen anything like that done before. And it's funny because we just fell into it. It wasn't something that, like it wasn't part of, I didn't, I didn't put together a, I don't have a curriculum, you know, I don't, it's, it's only based on the fact that I have a, you know, I minored in art history, so I know a little something mm -hmm. about, about, uh, about art, and 
the fact that my daughter is really game for this sort of thing. And you're right, she loves dress up. She loves <laughs> hair stuff and jewelry. And all of this is really appealing to her. So it was just this perfect coming together. And it's, it's very time consuming, right? So that's, that makes that's me good. happy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it takes up a whole day. Um, Obviously, I think your daughter had a lot to do with it because <laughs> not everybody, too, uh, would, you, know, you could, all kids would be interested in that after some, you know, sharing of the idea. But I mean, your daughter seemed to jump at it right away. Oh, right away. Yeah, mm -hmm. there was, there she was liked, no hesitation. Looking, like looking at the. I mean, and you know, part those photo shoots, you know, my wife laughs because those photo shoots, um, those, those aren't two or three minute things, you know, she's, it, took hours. You know, it, it is, it's out, you know, she tries on different types of clothes and I have her pose in different ways. And, you know, for a, a four or a five year old, she's very patient. And, and part of it, you know, and, and part of it, I think isn't, it's not just about like humoring me. It's about the fact that she actually likes it. Mm -hmm. If she didn't mm -hmm. like yeah. doing it, you know, you could have done it. Like forcing a five year old to do something that lasts hours would be literally <laughs> tears in 15 minutes, you know? So she but, really but likes she, it. And that's she the got, she got the expression down so well. Yeah. I mean, there's dramatics in there, mm -hmm. you know, there's theatrical costuming and color. She pays attention it's to just... the, she likes the faces. She, she spends a lot of time on the faces. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Let me show you another one, Pearly, as long as I have you here. Okay, yeah. Gee, I'm yeah. obviously, it's a close observer. Yeah, there you go. Hmm. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's great. Oh. And that's, uh, of course, that's Degas. And this is a beautiful one because this is, this is in Boston. So this is the first, when this pandemic is over, the first place yeah. we're going is to, is to visit the little dancer in Boston. Um, oh. And she's just thrilled. Yeah. She's thrilled by the fact that there was something. There was one that we could actually go see. <laughs> you know that was, that really yeah. meant a lot to her. You know. You know there are a lot of museums right, that are doing one. virtual yeah. tours. And there's uh, Frida. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. Oh my God, I love it. And uh, she mm. did all the. We cut out all of the dragonflies and the butterflies, so we did all the the crafts. Oh, uh, her, that's incredible! Her mother did the makeup, so the the dual eyebrow and the yeah. little, she even has <laughs> a little mustache. You can see. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then she wanted to hold holding her own Frida doll was her idea, so she's oh. actually cradling her own Frida in her arms. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. way cool. That's like a whole nother level. Right. Yeah. That's, That's awesome. I, lo oh. I love it. I mean, they're all brilliant. They really then, are. Of course. Yes. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the painting on the back wall, that's her painting that she made. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then uh, I have one more here, which you'll probably recognize. There's the Andy Warhol. <laughs> Andy Warhol, oh. yeah. <laughs> and um, uh. that's... Uh, that the hairdo is we that's construction paper. We made that hairdo with markers and construction paper. So we <laughs> fitted it on her, and she decorated it. And um, the um, that's not actual makeup. That's actually just a filter app that we could use. For, it's uh -huh. literally called an Andy Warhol filter app that we could use. Yeah. So we did. That's that so too. much fun. Oh, it's it's amazing. That really is a great project. So it's been yes. a fun project. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And I have all the, you know, and I have all the outtakes and everything too. I could even put together, like, just to give you some idea of how these things are all put together, you know, um, like, uh, like I'll show you, like, the platform. Here's the platform where she was sitting on, for example. That would be great. It's amazing. So that would be a good book too, Dan, yeah. for getting a permission for all that art. Oh. art. <laughs> so you can see the, the background. So we had her stand on something. And I needed so I can match the floor with the background, and I was going to make it all black, so I didn't care about the fact that there was that there was stripping in there. But we didn't have that's her ballet outfit, but we didn't have a gold ballet outfit, oh. so I actually had to colorize her once I got the background set up. Then I had to actually colorize um, her ballet outfit to match the gold in the in the Degas painting. So 
there's there's a lot of uh, touching up that happens after the fact but none mm -hmm. of this is photoshop touching up i don't have photoshop and i can't use it so these are just like my iphone filters and and different little you know free apps and so forth that i can use um to 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 do this and in almost all of the cases she was part of that um, you know i didn't do very i didn't I didn't, you know, just take the pictures and she walked away. I, we actually would sit down then. We talk about different ways to, to, to pose and different ways to colorize and things like that. So she was act pretty actively involved in, in the whole. That, the that whole is thing. awesome. Here's, yeah. her, here's her with, uh, as we're setting up our Frida, you can see the, <laughs> that's our TV in the background. This is sort of our studio that we designed. And she brought all of her animals down because we had to see whether the brown monkey or the black monkey worked better against the background. And mm -hmm. um, so there's, you know, there's there's a lot of outtakes that I have for this before all of the all of the touch ups happen. So that would be an interesting it would be an interesting um, an interesting uh, uh, presentation just in and of itself. I think you're probably right. Yeah. We also did one. This is a local artist. Her name is um, uh, Eileen Graves. And uh, the one painting on the left is Eileen's. And then we did. Um... We're not there yet. We still... We're not. No. We don't see that. Oh, you're not seeing it? Okay, wait. Hold on. Let me, let me see if I can bring up Eileen. All right. Let's see if I can bring it up now for you. <clears throat> There you go. Can you see that now? No, there, no. Oh. It's pretty. Oh wow. Yeah. Uh, and this is the same thing. Eileen gave us the the um, permission to use the, her background. That's her original background. And uh, I just used an app to remove the original girl from the background. Hmm. And then I did a whole series of shoots of uh, shots with Uma, cut her out of the picture, and plopped her into the original mm -hmm. background. Oh, yes. that's so sweet. That is great. Yeah. So we yeah. have a lot of fun with these and she's learning a lot. And, you know, she's, you know, she's quite a craft. She's like you, Edith. She's quite a crafter. She loves crafting and gluing and cutting and doing all that stuff. And when we go out on our, um, on our hike, she actually has a field journal. Mm -hmm. she, she draws in and draws pictures of, and she has a, a whole series of fire towers that she's drawn a picture pictures of. So yeah. <laughs> That's one of her favorites. I things. like the one that's uh, the fire tower, um, Mount Manan, Pac Mananak. Pac Mananak, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, where she, that's where she earned her patch. The, the one oh, that's, her... yeah. Hey, Dan, could you put your contact info yes. in the chat? Of course. Let me do cool. that. I have a website and all that good stuff. But that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, but of course, I'm, I'm, on, I'm all over social media and so forth, too. So if, if you're on there and mm -hmm. you want to come and throw me a friend request, we can do that. Okay. And that's how somebody can get a hold of me. Well, thanks for everybody. And oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah.